Um, I'm really gratified that a schwack of students just walked in. So if you haven't taken seats, um, come a little closer. Grab cookies. And grab cookies and don't leave. Because that's it's just. OK. So I, it's my pleasure um, today to sort of open, to open the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. This is uh, our Pride and Joy um, classroom at the Edwards School of Business. And this actually is the eighth presentation in the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. And for those of you um, who walk in through the main doors, um, you'll see all kinds of framed photos of previous speakers. And so the first thing you see when you walk in the Edwards School of Business is us honoring the previous seven uh, speakers who, who have been part of this series. And I look at our guests today and tell you you will be part of the history of this school forever in those pictures. Loving that, yeah. That's why it's good you did your hair. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Gordon and Maureen. They've been very good friends at the Edwards School of Business. In fact, Gordon is um, a graduate. I actually was able to go back to his transcripts and verify that for those of you who didn't, who weren't quite sure. And I not not so. That's that's Brian McRae, <laughs> another guy whose transcripts I will check carefully. I'll sell them back to you, your courses, as you get more successful. Anyway, um, Maureen is a graduate of uh, the College of Education, and I will leave it to their dean to actually do the verification. The Haddocks have been true entrepreneurs in this province. As every year we've had this series, and every year I see people in the community, I see people who have been friends of theirs, I see people who have taken pride in their achievements, and who really enjoy it. It's, it's a network where a lot of people know each other, and there's a certain oomph in the, in the room when um, this talk happens, and you can feel the energy. It's different than other events. People are buzzing, and I notice that, and I think that's really a tribute to the Haddocks. They began the speaker series in 2007, and with each year, we've um, had the very good fortune to hear from a variety of all kinds of different entrepreneurs um, with different stories. And what we have basically found is there's, there's no one formula, right? There has to be passion, and there has to be talent, and there has to be interest, interest but there's no one formula. And um, today is a very unique formula. We also, um, it's my pleasure to announce that Gord and Maureen, um, because of their belief in the school, as it has turned 100 um, and is in the process of turning 100, have actually increased their donations. So they have broken the threshold through years and years of giving. So yeah, I, I have their permission to say that they have um, been now $100,000 donors and will be honored on our wall of fame out there. <laughs> so. So um, I, I think the best thing I can do at this point, aside from just acknowledging their friendship and their generosity, their personal friendship and their great generosity to the school, is turn it over to Gordon, because it's his tradition that he takes over with his freaky entrepreneurial energy. <laughs> and he, he just, I couldn't stop him. Uh, his wife's been trying for many years, but she can't stop him. So he's going to get up here, and he's going to do the formal Introductions to her. <laughs> yeah. Cheat sheets. You know what that is? That's the worst thing that can happen to a radio station. <laughs> it's called the sounds of silence or dead air, I think is the term. I'm not sure. And uh, it's not something that radio stations want to hear. 
What they like is, hi, kids, and we're broadcasting live from the Edwards School of Business. That's on the beautiful University of Saskatchewan campus in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. That's Saskatchewan, the rectangular province wedged in between Alberta and Manitoba. <laughs> there's, lots of, there's, lots of ways <laughs> there's lots of ways to make money in the world, and one of them is talking. And doing a little rant for 10 seconds is pretty easy. But imagine trying to talk for two hours, three hours, four hours, five days a week, 12 months of the year. And I'm happy to say that our guests have been able to do that successfully for decades. So it's really a, an amazing thing. Um, the goal of our speaker series for the new guests is very simple. We just want to inspire even one person to start their business. And what we do is we provide an event where the speakers tell their entrepreneurial journeys. And we hope that you can see that anything is possible. And over the past eight years, as Daphne has mentioned, we, we've had all sorts of people. We've had male speakers, female speakers, uh, father-son team, we've had a married couple, we've had entrepreneurs with degrees, entrepreneurs without degrees, but this is something different. Um, most of the speakers, and I would guess probably all of them, started out being entrepreneurial right out of the chute, whether it was out of college or high school. But what happens when you've got a successful couple who work together in the same business, they work together on the same show, and then later in life, one of them decides to, one, go back to university, and not get one degree, but get three degrees, and one of those degrees wasn't even in the province, it was out of province, and then two, gets all entrepreneurial and all crazy and wants to start her own business. Now, as you can see by my wife's hair, it's white. Uh, we, those of us that have been doing this for years, um, we're used to the challenges and the changes and the crazy things that go on. But in this case, you're giving up security and you're giving up success and you're taking a whole new direction. And I would think that was a little bit scary. Um, it takes a dream. It takes courage, and it takes a great life partner to stand behind you with all the crazy things that I know go on when you do this sort of thing. Um, our next guests have been part of our lives. You, you know, when you hear somebody every day, they sort of sound like family, and you may have never even met them. Um, so I'm pretty excited to hear their entrepreneurial story from both sides of the table. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Penny Murphy and Brent Lux. <laughs> Thank you, Gord. <laughs> Thank you. I think wow. I found my summer replacement. Yes, <laughs> big time. Did the boss job? <laughs> Did a good job. Wow. Hello. <laughs> I looked at it this way when I found out, as Daphne said, we're just the eight in the series. And I thought, everybody else must be in Palm Springs. Yeah. <laughs> That's got to be it. <laughs> you know, we're honored, like honestly. Oh, over the moon honored. Honored is, is an understatement. I want to start off first by saying uh, thanks. And it's kind of weird now that I look around, I realize I've got some wonderful co-workers and friends that are here from Rolco Radio. Well, I said we have to tell the truth because they know the real story. So. <laughs> Our accountant's here. Yes, <laughs> love you. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and we really have to tell the truth with him in the room. <laughs> and Derek over here is one of my longtime listeners, and he's a financial guy too, so we got all these different components to this, this group here. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting. We need to be on our A game, sir. I need to tell you, uh, just before we kind of get rolling here, that uh, uh, for those of you that know me, uh, you know that I've been madly in love with this woman for a ton of years, and I know as, as her husband, and it's a given in relationships, you know, when somebody asks what your partner does, you tell them and you go on, you rave on at great length about uh, everything they, they've accomplished and the things that they've done. 
But in my case, I know I've got lots of other people that feel the same about the accomplishments of my wife, and, and I look at some of the amazing awards that she's received. Um, I know with uh, our friends from Sabex, uh, in the early going of, of her business, Penny got Small Business of the Year, and also uh, excellence in, in customer service. Um, Keith Moen, I know, is going to be here at some point. Uh, oh, he's there! there he I didn't even see you, Keith! From the NSBA, and uh, Penny last year, uh, well, a few years ago, got the Small Business of the Year, and also uh, was invited as a guest on their uh, very popular Lessons I've Learned panel, which is just a hoot, and, and it's much like what we're doing here today. It's, it's being able to hear the stories of different business people and the adventures they've had. Um, she's my woman of distinction, but the YWCA a number of years ago um, honored her that way as well. One of her passions that you'll hear about through our, our little presentation today is she loves working with women in workshops. Um, she kind of has the approach, I think, I'm not speaking out of turn, that if she can do it, everybody else can do it too. And, and she loves being in front of a room of people. And it's I'll sort of that, but we also have champagne at 3 o'clock on a Friday <laughs> afternoon. <so. laughs> uh, the highlight, though, I, I think she'd have to agree, the highlight has been last November, um, she was nominated by... A, another businesswoman here in Saskatoon uh, through RBC's... Uh, Betty Ann Hagee, who is a very good friend of the Edwards School of Business. Canadian Women Entrepreneur Awards. And we did the standard, oh, it's just an honour to be nominated, the field of 4,000 women entrepreneurs and from was. across Canada. And then she made the cut, she was down to the final three in her category, and we did the old, well, it's very nice, we're very <laughs> excited, it's, it's, it's enough to just to be there. And then we go to this beautiful awards banquet at the Royal York in Toronto, and I think I just about jumped onto the top of the table when they announced she was the winner in her category. <laughs> he was hooting and hollering. They must have known we were from Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, down home, let's and, get at and it. I, just to show you, I was in such bad shape. Like, I'm like crying. I'm so happy for her. I can't believe it. And later, another woman who received an award said, my husband can't be here tonight, unlike Penny and her weepy husband. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, weepy. But I'm proud of her. And, and, uh, it was sweet. It wasn't weepy. I'm, I'm just following in her wake is all I'm doing here. But we make a good no team. Uh, one other thing, too, before we get rolling with our program. Uh, when Maureen first called me about this, um, I had a voicemail on my phone. And I'm listening to the voicemail that night. And I, I listened to it once. And I listened again. And I said to Penny, this is weird. I said, Maureen has called. And she wants us to speak at the Edwards School of Business. And Penny said, oh, that's great. And I says, yeah, but she wants me to speak as a, I think she says, a professional stalker. <laughs> and I thought, why in God's name would she think that I'm a professional stalker? Well, have you looked at your Facebook page lately? <laughs> <laughs> Oprah loved the first kiss. She was a little funny with me when I, you know, I tried for the second, third, and fourth. I, I don't think that's stalking. Rick Mercer, on the other hand, he asked me, he wanted to date me after uh, well, who you know, really? the, the first kiss. And then, of course, uh, my most recent conquest was uh, Hillary. Uh, you don't see it in the picture, but when our eyes met, her eyes said yes. Unfortunately, your six heavily armed bodyguards said, no way, Johnny Canuck. <laughs> So then I realized, oh, you want us to speak as a professional talker, talker. Not, not a stalker. Yes. There There's we go. The more we just caught it. Yeah. We'll slow down so that you can, yeah. Do you want us to repeat that part? Yeah. Oh, stalker, talker. Okay, okay. Well, uh, you can ask Brent about his stalking. Uh, after our presentation, I'm sure he'd be thrilled to give you the uh, down and dirty <laughs> details. But uh, we, we're here to talk about our journey as entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, we thought if it's all right with you, we would do this in a format that is extremely familiar to us. And that is one of interviewing. Uh, you know, on the radio, um, Brent still does it, but when we work together, we would interview our uh, listeners. Um, Brent has some amazing interviews that he does, and uh, really in my world, in the counseling world, a counseling session is a conversation that asks questions that really is another form of an interview. So I thought, well, why don't we interview one another? And I must admit, I had a hidden motive in that. If uh, you had ever had the chance to listen to us on the air when we used we used to work together, you know that Brent is infamous for hogging the mic. <laughs> so I thought, well, at least this way, I will be able to have a go. And 
So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Does that uh, meet everybody's approval? We're okay, okay to go there? All right. Well then, uh, let's go back 11 years. Okay. Um, you'd already done your radio gig with Rolko, and we, we really should give kudos oh. to Gord Rawlinson and Pam Layla and the president of Rolko because of how generous they were with you in, in your uh, movement away mm -hmm. from the company. Uh, so you went to Calgary, got your, your master's uh, in social work. Your intention was to come back here, set up shop as a standalone counselor. Yes. You were going to hang your shingle up and, and save the world. Yep, all by myself. The universe had different plans. Yes, what happened? Yes, it did. Um, you know, and it, was, it was a crazy and exciting time. I remember uh, uh, distinctly when I moved to Calgary, I left Brent and the kids here so that I could do my master's degree there and at the University of Calgary, which was a thrilling experience, but nowhere near as incredible as my first degree at the University of Saskatchewan, and that is the truth. Uh, but I remember calling home and I would be crying and saying, I hate it here, I want to come home. I don't know anybody, people in Calgary, nobody talks to each other on the street, and I talk to strangers every day, and nobody would make eye contact with me. I think they thought I was crazy or a weirdo, and you know, <laughs> both of which are true, but people in Saskatoon <laughs> like me all the same. <laughs> right, and uh, it, it was, uh, I was way out of my comfort zone, and um, it didn't feel good at first, but uh, Brent kept saying to me, you know, if you come home, how will you feel? You know, will you come home proud, and is that the person you want to be? And I said, of course not, it is not, and so he kicked my ass good, and I, for one time, listened to him, and uh, while I was away in Calgary, uh, a fellow by the name of Ted Cardwell, who was really Saskatoon's very first Dr. Phil. Yeah. He had a TV show on at lunchtime. He was a counselor. He was the first in private practice uh, to have a counseling agency. And he was a big deal when I was growing up. Everybody knew who Ted was. And uh, so I got a call from him out of the blue saying, um, you know, Penny, I, I've been watching your, your uh, journey, and I know that you're getting your master's and that you wanted to open up your own counseling shop. But... He said, I want to retire, so why don't you buy mine? And that serves both of our interests. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he had a, a, a thriving but a rather small um, counseling agency. It was him and, and three others. And, um, boy, you know, that wasn't the plan. And, uh, but the more I kept thinking about it, the more I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And so there were days when it was super over the moon exciting. And there were days when it was scary as hell. And boy, self-doubt. You can't do it. You've never been in business before. You don't know what the heck you're doing. How dare you think that you could own a business and be an entrepreneur? Uh, and then, thank goodness, you know, the self-confidence would rear its wonderful head and say, well, you know, if other people can do it, you can do it. And, uh, but it was, for both of us, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Whoa, slow down, no, you know, and so it was, it was, quite, um, it was quite a time, but uh, before I finished uh, the, the degree, we had made the decision that we were both comfortable with it, and that was that we were going to go ahead and buy the business, and, uh, um, you know, we've never looked back, and it's uh, probably, other than marrying this fine man, uh, the best decision that I've ever made in my life, uh, just the world opened up. It was... A cool experience. Sure was, yeah. yeah. Well, let me have a go at you this time. So you asked me what my memory was. Do you remember how fun and how scary it was mm -hmm. at the beginning for you? Oh, and, yeah. You know, tell us a little bit about your experience there. Well, you know, I, I, <laughs> I remember the highs and the lows much the same, and, and you're trying to garner all this information. And uh, luckily he's not here, but our good friend Paul Jasper, who was our original accountant and now we have the, he was the uh, we have the wonderful Michael Gorniak from he was the trial accountant yeah, now we've got yeah. the real deal <laughs> but Paul was one of those and Paul's still around today we at his house on the weekend and We're great friends we we ask him for advice quite often in fact we asked him for advice that time and he said no nah, don't do it he says you don't need to buy a business Penny go hang your shingle so we, contrarians that we are we said no we're gonna do we're it gonna anyway <laughs> so that was a little scary when you've got this man who you believe has all your good interests at heart and he says don't do it and we go opposite to what his advice was mm -hmm. but we do that quite often over the course of our of our business years we ask for advice from a lot of different people not necessarily taking it but it's good to get a lot of input what i remember in the in the early days is we both had this idea and i think a lot of 
as you're starting out with a business. You feel first that you can do everything, and then there's that little voice in your head saying, well, you have to do everything because you can't afford to get all these other people to do it for you. And so it started off rather innocently with me. I said, I'll do the books. How tough can that be? And remember, you know? we have zero business experience. Yeah. So okay? we, you know, I bought QuickBooks, threw it on the computer at work, and I'm running things, and I'm thinking, ah, there's nothing to it. I'm doing payroll, I'm paying the bills. Things are working the way I believe they're supposed to work. And I think we'd filed our second quarter GST. And uh, we get a call one day from CRA, and it's just like, <coughs> oh my God. <laughs> Turns out we, I wasn't doing the GST quite right. I'm not supposed to get a check back from them. <laughs> we and we'd, thought, we'd, well, had, we'd had a couple fantastic. of $3,000 checks, and I said, man, this GST filing, this is gold. <laughs> so GST audit followed, and turns out actually the way it had been done in the business for some time was not quite Before correct. Before us. Yeah, 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 so we just so there was a bit of a there, shake so, out there. Yeah. So that was, that was a little fearful, but it was, it was a learning curve. You know, you go into it, and you have to look at them as, as they're there to help you, and then the people doing the audit were very nice and they were very helpful. And since then, we've got the GST figured out. Um, but it, it's, it's what we quickly learned. Like, I still kind of do the books. We have a bookkeeper and, of course, Michael Gorniak is the guy that has to clean it all up at the, the end ship. of the year. Yep. Um, you know, I go in, I pay the bills. I'm, I'm anal about the cash flow. I, I want to know where everything is and the bills are getting paid and everybody else is getting paid and where the money flow is. But on top of that, we sure learned as any business person does earn, uh, learn, you got to focus on your strengths and leave the other stuff. Your time's too valuable. And I know with Penny, what we've really developed in, in our process is I just want her to dream and to construct and to draw business and I'll deal with all the muck. And then under me, we have an o a wonderful office manager. And between the two of us, you know, we've, we've made sure we've got a great computer guy that does all the computer stuff for us, looks after our server. We've got a great accountant, uh, our good friend Lenore Moen, who coincidentally is Keith Moen's wife. Uh, Lenore is the person who's given us all this good experience and advice over the years on marketing. Yep. You know, we'd been in radio all these years. We thought, oh, yeah, well, we, we know, know everything about marketing. We knew nothing about <laughs> marketing. And we did some of the silly, silly things right off the top. You know, we bought a big two-page, yellow pages never ad. Never do that again. Dinosaur. Never, yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> Woo. So it's surrounding yourself with people. And, and, you know, initially you say, well, it costs money. Well, sure, it costs money, but it costs money to make money. And it allows you to focus your time on those areas that are your strengths. So that's the stuff that I really remember from those first years. How about, how about the process of the business for you in the first years? Well, um you know, during those first years, you call yourself a business owner and you still don't really believe it's true. It's, it's everywhere, but you haven't kind of, it hasn't sunk in yet. But, um, you know, looking back, what I really bought from Ted was the foundation of the business. And uh, we kept one counselor, she's still with us today. Uh, the others, um, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. Uh, uh, they didn't fit into my vision. Um, you know, but with, with that foundation came some baggage, uh, and that was the reality, uh, that there was some building of bridges and rebuilding that I had to do personally as a business owner uh, based on the company that I bought. And uh, so, uh, you know, there was little niggly things like that, but it literally was like having a golden egg dropped in my lap. Uh, you know, we had some accounts to get us started, so we weren't having to go out door to door to find clients, you know, we could be up and operating and run the business. Uh, we were able to then build on that success and uh, add more accounts. And, uh, you know, it was the time in Saskatchewan, if you recall back, uh, we had a new government. Brad Wall and gang had just been elected. Our riders won the Grey, Grey Cup for the first time in years. Uh, money was flowing in a big boom in Saskatchewan, times were good, and it was a great time to be in business, and it still is. But, you know, I wasn't the only one that noticed how great it was in Saskatoon, and uh, as a result, uh, competition came into town that we had never faced before, and that is national companies coming in who offer employee and family assistance programs, and uh, traditionally that had been the main staple for counseling agencies up until that point for uh, the majority of others in the business. And when the nationals came in, uh, they went after these great big, you know, juicy contracts in a big way. And they came in and would uh, lowball, and the locals, you, we just couldn't compete. 
And um, you know, I knew they, we couldn't compete based on price, but I knew damn well that the quality and the service, we had them, you know, we, we, they couldn't compete with us on that. So it was a frightening time. You know, we, uh, we, we had five of the health region accounts out of 11, and uh, the government took all of the 11 and put them into one account, and that account went to the national company, a national company. And so immediately, five big accounts were gone from our cash flow and our workflow. And uh, that was a major blow, and it was, you know, I, I had no idea. I, I, being new in business, I didn't even know to expect that. And so it, it was frightening, and I remember sitting down with uh, Keith and Lenore and Sandy and, and her husband Doug and Brent and I out at our place, and, and I, uh, you know, we were just having dinner and having some wine, and I said, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm scared. I, I don't know what to do, and uh, thank goodness, I mean, they love me and support me, encourage me, and I could talk about it, and, and you know, they were firing some things to me, and uh, as it turned out, I am so grateful that I had that experience because out of that darkness came the opportunity to really redefine who we were as a company and who we wanted as clients. And it was that redefinition and restart and refocus that propelled us forward into success. And so without that challenge and uh, that, you know, the adversity, I don't, I'm sure we would have got there, but we sure got there a hell of a lot quicker, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, because basically it was either you do something or you die. And I didn't want to die, so you got to do something. And, and uh, you know, when you so say I, die, you mean the business dies. The business dies. dies. You weren't yeah. going to jump no, off a no, bridge. No, 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 okay. no. Especially in the counseling business. Yeah, exactly. Wouldn't look good. Wouldn't, wouldn't look, look good. good for business, no. <laughs> Owner commits suicide, no. No, no. Uh, you know, you so, got some good advice, though, uh, when it came to big guys coming to town and stealing your business did, from you know, another business person. I did, person and uh, I, I am forever grateful. Arnie Shaw and Linda Shaw, who own Centennial Plumbing, uh, I had them uh, over to dinner and talked a lot because, of course, Arnie owned Centennial Plumbing, and years ago, all of a sudden, Home Depot came to town. And, you know... And they that, reinvented themselves. And they did, mm -hmm. and they, they continue to do so. And so, you know, that was really good to be able to talk to people you trust and you know, how did you do it? What, what did you do? What were you thinking? And, and then to kind of pick out those pieces that were relevant and that I could learn from. So, you know, the first few years were heady, and then it was like your face getting smashed into the pavement uh, as a wake-up call, but then a phoenix <laughs> rising out of the ashes. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the adversity because that really, it, it helped my growth and the company's growth. Yeah. You're doing good. Am I doing okay? You're doing good. Okay. <laughs> so now it's my turn to ask a question again. Uh, what has been <laughs> the most difficult thing for you to deal with in bankers. terms of being a business? Bankers. <laughs> bankers and bank. And, and you know, I don't, nothing against the banks per se. You know, in most businesses you need the bank. You have to have a relationship. But uh, my experience has been bankers could learn a lot about having relationships. They, they tend to move people in and out. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you our first experience. We had dealt with one bank here in the city for years. And I was on the phone with one of their managers when we were at the very point where Penny had decided we're buying this business. And I was talking to one of the managers on a different matter altogether, personal matter. And I said to her, I said, oh, by the way, I might be coming to see you soon to open up a business account. And she said, really, why? And I said, we're looking at uh, buying an existing business here in town. And what was the noise she made? <laughs> <laughs> and I could just, I can see her shaking her head and going, and she says, oh boy, she says, you know, small business success, it's tough. I said, oh, geez, thanks for jumping on the bandwagon. Thanks for giving her the old... <laughs> Call it dry. So I discussed that with some other business people that I knew, and I said, is this normal? And they said, no. So I actually changed banks and, uh, at that time, and we've been with the bank that we're now with. And it hasn't been perfect. First, but it was great. We had it was incredible for, uh, a fabulous banker, banker, a woman yeah. that we just loved, and she's a friend of ours now, and her and her husband are in business now, too. And but she retired. Great people. She really got it, and she got us. 
And then we got the female version of Hitler after that, <laughs> where there was no flexibility. And, and I understand they've got a business, yeah. but you know how it is. It's a personality thing. And, and you want somebody that knows you, has a better sense of your business, and you want to know them. You want to know that if, if you phone them someday and say, gee, we've got an issue, can you help us? They've got your back. Yeah, right, and, yeah. and not like, nope, page five, rule four, you cannot do that. Goodbye. You know, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a state of flux and it's something we have to work on. I don't, I don't blame the bank 100%, but that's been from my side of the business where I kind of deal with that, that stuff. I just think the banks could do a better job of, of building relationships or finding people or coaching their people to be a little more relationship oriented. We've, we've worked with some gold ones over the years and worked with some duds. Maybe they could use counseling. Maybe they could. <laughs> so, you know, just real quick, yep. uh, a look back then to, you know, when you bought the business, it was a, a dusty little office down on 25th Street. Yeah. And uh, you've changed it quite a bit yep. over the 10 years. Talk a little bit about your vision of, of how you saw this thing progressing over these 10 well, years. Well, and that, that's it, it was a vision. Um, you know, the company originally, before we bought it, like Brent said, um, ran out of a little office on 25th Street, an older building, and, you know, I guess it served its purpose. It was utilitarian, but that wasn't my vision. Um, and so we are in now uh, some absolutely amazingly beautiful offices in Stonebridge. We've got big windows, colors everywhere. You can see I like color, so it shouldn't come as a surprise. But it, it really had to do with the vision. I thought to myself, if I was a customer, what would I want? And I would want a wonderful environment for not only the customers, but also for the staff to work in. I would want absolutely high quality in terms of the people that I'm working with. And, you know, to be quite honest, um, the work we do is important work. It, this is people's lives. This is their happiness. Um, this is their relationship. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want any 50 percenters on my team. I want the grade A top students and with experience and people that are passionate. And so it was really the whole vision about, um, it was more than just the counseling session, it was the whole experience from first point of contact to coming into the office for the first time to uh, you know the high, high, highly trained staff, the counseling, the quality. We offer 100% satisfaction guarantee because if it's not right, I'm not doing my job, and um, that's important to me. And so I think that that that's really how the business morphed is to follow that. And I, I you know, I do admit I have a very different business model uh, compared to the traditional counseling companies. And I want our clients to leave and tell their friends and their family and their colleagues and anybody who will listen. I want them to say. Gee whiz, I went to Penny Murphy and Associates, couple sessions, learned some really cool tools to use, helped me change my situation, life is good. Versus the old way of doing things that really worked for the counselor and for the counseling agencies, and that was to keep clients coming back because we call it working the file. <laughs> you know, if they keep coming, you keep making money. And, you know, but clients in that situation, their story to friends and colleagues and family would be, gee whiz, you know, I've been going for six months and the situation's not any better. And so our whole model has been around making sure that our clients are seeing and realizing positive change in two to three sessions and that they're leaving with tools that they can use. You know, you come in for stress, if we hold your hand and say they're there and we listen to your story, well, for sure you're gonna feel better, but in three weeks if you face stress again, you're none the wiser, right? So we want to give you tools so that next time you face stress, you know how to do it on your own. You're not dependent on us, you're empowered. And that, that is the key behind where I want the business to be is we want to empower people. We want to help them change their lives if they want to, if they want to take it from good to great, if they're hurting and they don't want to be, they need the tools. They need people who know how to do this kind of thing to share their experience, their knowledge, their compassion and their passion. And uh, so that's really, I think that's where we've taken it from over here to here. Okay, in 30 seconds, tell yeah. me, because a lot of people I know come up to you and say, well, I know yeah. you're a counseling agency, but I see you do other stuff. Yeah. What is that other stuff? Well, we work with businesses to help, uh, you know, their employees, uh, because everybody knows if you're having an issue at home, you take it with you to work in one form or another, or if you're having a, an issue at work with a colleague or a boss, you bring it home. 
And so the two are very closely related. So we help businesses, we do mediation, we do uh, harassment investigations, I do training, go and do workshops for companies, I do my own workshops. And so it, you know, we try and make it kind of a one-stop shop for anything that is, is going on in your life. And if you want to make it better or change it in a different direction, we can help you. Okay. Thanks. Ask me a question. I'm going to. <laughs> See, she does you. get paid to talk, yes, as you can I tell. Do. So, uh, you know, all of this time we've been talking about Penny Murphy and Associates, but, the, you know, the reality is it's, it's more than just Penny Murphy and Associates. Uh, and so I thought maybe you would talk about what you do and well, under the realm of our... You're a very fortunate woman. Oh. You know. <laughs> um, Isn't be, that the You truth? know, and, and every entrepreneur, every business person's path is different. You know, we had the luxury that we both worked for a great company as salaried employees. Penny had communications with them over the years that she was going to work her way away from it. And they allowed her, like you completed your first two degrees while you still worked to what, some what level. A gift. And, what a gift. and then, of course, then I continue on in the radio as I still do today. And so having that backing us up, we didn't quite have the same anxiety as somebody who just no. quits doing everything and says, okay, we're going to start earning money and do this now. So we had that luxury. And for me, uh, you know, radio has been my career. It's, I've been doing it for a long time, 40-some <laughs> years. Yeah. But uh, I love it, and I love that I have this great company that I work for, and they allow me the freedom to do other stuff. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough through the generosity of another great entrepreneur, uh, Orm Asher here in town, who uh, started the whole hospital home lottery thing. I've been his voice guy now for, oh my God, on some of these lotteries, like 30 years. And I always laugh, you know, I'll have people say, hey, you know, I was in Toronto last week. Is that you on the radio? And I go, yeah. And they always seem disgusted. <laughs> they say, Lauchs is on the radio in Toronto. <laughs> He's everywhere. In Calgary and Halifax. But, so that, that's just one fun aspect. And, and honestly, you know, it's, it's been a wonderful career radio for me and uh, I, I don't consider it work. And I know a lot of people as I just hit my 60th birthday here a while ago, uh, a lot of people say, so when are you going to retire? I don't think I want to retire. And I was talking to Maureen and, and Gord here the same way, is if you got a plan for retirement, the way to keep yourself occupied and feel you're passionate about something, great. But if you're doing something you're passionate about right now, why? Why leave it? If you have the flexibility and the room to continue working, um, I know there's maybe some young people behind you that say, get the hell out of the way and let me go. <laughs> but for the time being, uh, we both love what we do. And we were joking about it when we were coming into work. I, I, and I'm sure most business people are, uh, think this way, and especially when you have the luxury of both of you so engaged in the business and all your work. Penny's still tight with all of our Rolco family, and I'm at her office every day. And, and we've got this just great, great combination of people and, and the relationships we have with them. And like, you know, we're, we're, we really are kind of nerds. We go on a holiday, <laughs> and what do we do? We always look in the phone book for competing businesses in these other cities, and we drive by their offices, or, or, or we phone them to see how they answer their phone. And, <laughs> but that, that makes it fun. They, you know, they, call. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm, I guess maybe I am yes. a stalker. Then. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I, uh, it's, it's this past 11 years, as great as our careers, I think, had been up to this point, uh, I, I get it now why, you know, if you're a young person and you're considering entrepreneurship, it's scary as hell I get it, but God love you. Like, man, having 40, 50 years ahead of you at this point, that, that's our biggest regret yeah. that we didn't do this 10, 20 years earlier, but we're here and now. Tell them about the company, our corporation. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, we incorporated, as a lot of businesses do, and they'll tell you, you know, your lawyer, and we've got a great lawyer, and he's okay, you've got to come up with a name <laughs> for the company. And of course, this is 11 years ago. And I said, okay, it's going to be Merlot Holdings. And he says, yeah, that's good wine, isn't it? And I said, no. I said, it's M U as in Murphy and L O. So we're Merlot Holdings. <laughs> but we do like the wine. <laughs> but we do like the wine, yeah. And under, yeah. under the you know, umbrella is uh, of Merlot, Penny Murphy and Associates, and Brent's company is BP Media. And so we both, uh, we both operate under the same. But we feel blessed. We sure. feel we're really lucky people and uh, work with some tremendous people. And uh, I, I, I'm still in shock that we're up here telling our story. But thank you, uh, Gordon Maureen. This Big is just time. absolutely awesome. Big time. And with that, I guess we could just say that's, that's a quick rundown on our story. It is. Um, you know, we, we have left out the biggest piece that has been crucial to our success. And that is, uh, just like Maureen and Gord, it is, uh, we are fortunate to have 
an amazing relationship. And As I said, you're a very lucky woman. I am woman. the luckiest girl in the world. Yeah, I, I always remind myself of that. But you know, it, that, that I couldn't imagine, and nor would I want to do this journey without Brent. And um, you know, not everybody can work together uh, as, as a couple, and, uh, but we loved it, uh, being on the radio together, being, uh, you know, in business together, and really that is the only regret I have in leaving the radio station, and that is that I am not working with my sweetheart all day long. You know, I, I get him in bits and pieces after he's finished on the radio and he comes over to join the company and, and that, but uh, it, it's, it's wonderful being able to dream together and have a glass of wine and think about conquering the world yeah. and trying new things and we talk about business all the time but in a good positive way because it's energizing and it's exciting and it's you know the what ifs and could, could we do, we this? do yeah. that yeah. and do we dare and man, it's intoxicating not just the wine but the whole <laughs> you know being being the entrepreneur it's uh uh for me it's it, i think the thrill is being in charge of my own destiny and, yeah. and uh, being able to create the rules and you know nobody can stop me but me and that self-doubt that I talked about and, and so to have your best friend and your lover and your, and your husband, all four of us in one room. <laughs> <laughs> and my biggest job each day is finding a shirt that'll match your hair now. So. <laughs> That's the biggest thing yeah. I have to deal with. It's been a great ride. It certainly it? has. So mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our story. Gord, any, any questions? Uh, this is the time during the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pam, there's our fill-in. I'll, I'll start up with a question, and then if you think of something, mm -hmm. please, uh, and you can both go from here, because I don't like myself. Do you want this? Um, you, well, I could. You could. Yeah. We um, have the technology. <laughs> Don't give me the mic. <laughs> um, I did have a question because I, uh, someday we're going to take uh, the the DVDs of all the speakers and then you know edit edit them out and you know what's your biggest problem and you know you're going to hear like banker 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 and there's lots of really neat other similarities and I'm getting to my question yep. but. The one thing is that I have found, and, and I see it up here all the time, is the thing that you thought was the worst thing that could ever happen to you turns around to be the biggest, most positive thing that happened. Yep. Yeah. And it's exactly 100 degrees opposite mm -hmm. of what you thought at the time. And we've had some things. and. This was the end of the world, and it forced you to go somewhere else. But when you were saying, you know, what, when, when you decided we're going to do this, and what, what uh, problems he might have, like I was thinking of myself, and <laughs> when if my wife had said, "Well, I'm going to Calgary, and, <laughs> and you have the yeah. kids, <laughs> and <laughs> you're responsible," and and honestly, that would have terrified me. Yeah. And my daughter's here. And uh, I, I just wouldn't, I would have said, I can't do that. Yep. Because, I, well, I don't know. We had girls, and girls always <laughs> ask really scary <laughs> questions. <laughs> and we were raised in a family where to be quite open. And uh, I said, well, geez, you know, I was thinking, what if they ask this question? <laughs> so how did you do that? I mean, that's as guy to guy, yeah. you know, that's, it, you know it, it, that's a big thing. It was our two youngest that were at home at the time. They were teenagers. They were both in, in uh, school at Walter Murray. And it was our youngest, our daughter. And she would have been probably about 15, 16 yeah. then. And then Adam, our, our youngest son, was 17. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and honestly... And three dogs and, and a cat. I was just going to yeah. say, the, the biggest chore for me was the bloody animals. Yeah. Uh, because they were... We had a basset hound, a wiener dog, and a mutt. And they were mama's dogs. And Mama, every day, would take them for a nice long walk to the park, and she'd be picking up their poop. And I detested <laughs> all that, but I did it. So that was my biggest challenge. The kids were a breeze. Uh, our house at the time, we lived close to where the radio station was at the time, was on 8th Street. So it wasn't an issue for me getting around. Great neighbors, and, and trust me, WestJet got, we burned up our, our WestJet uh, miles a lot. We were back and forth on the weekends. I think we went one stretch where I had work and you had exams. 
through a January and February, and uh, it was kind of like we were teenagers when we finally, uh, <laughs> finally, hooked, <laughs> finally hooked up again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's still in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, but you know, it's 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 like nothing, yeah. anything else. We we both realized we were going down this path, and it was just part of the process. That uh, I, looking back on it now, it all seemed pretty easy in the moment. I guess it probably wasn't. But, you but know, and I know, guy to guy, you're thinking about that piece about you know looking after the kids in the house and everything. But what really impressed me was, I mean, we worked together. We were a team. And there was every possibility that with one of us gone, there would be consequences to Rent's job. And, uh, you know, never, never ever from the beginning of me saying, as much as I love my job, I need a new challenge, I need to try something different, to today. He has never said to me, that's silly, we can't afford it, don't do that, uh, what about me? It's always been, if that's what you want, we'll find a way. And like that, to me, is a huge sacrifice. I mean, he can handle the kids in the, in the house, but, uh, he, you know. You mean, uh, I, he, he's I've had better, He's better on air without me. I know that for sure. <laughs> he does a way better job now than, than uh, you know, the two of us when we were together. But he didn't know that at that time, right? And, and none of us did. And that, that took balls. And I should also thank the, uh, the Kangles family, who used to have the Delphi's <laughs> restaurant on 8th Street, because I think they fed me and the kids probably just about every day of the week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and leftovers for the dogs. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 So does someone have a question? Hi. There? Yeah, you know, Did everybody hear the question? Sorry, Penny. Yes, that's everybody right. got the question. Yeah, I, I, you make a good point, and you know, uh, everybody who's in business in this room knows that when you're the boss, there are few people that you can talk to and be vulnerable and get it all out, right? You, I mean, you can't you can't always talk to your staff or your managers. You have to talk to somebody who uh, keeps that information confidential and who gets it. And um, so uh, I don't do a lot of it, but uh, I, I love the opportunity when people come in in that situation to personally sit down with them. But uh, you know, I think uh, we sure get we sure get business owners and entrepreneurs coming in talking to our counselors about stress, about the fact that uh, you know if if the relationship at home isn't strong and supportive, uh, that has an impact on the business, oh, and yeah. so. Uh, y you know, we all have stresses and way too much on our plate. It uh, doesn't matter if we're in business or not. And, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to share that. And, and we, welcome, we welcome any chance that we can to help people and, and entrepreneurs in particular. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We've got uh, 20 years of experience underlying us, although I see Brian's here today, he started out young. <laughs> yeah. But when I look at my class, there's mm -hmm. a sense of, I don't know if I have the skills to do it. And I mean, when I yep. look back at my entrepreneurship, I wish I'd started when I was 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So what, is, what is your advice to my students? Well, uh, you know, I, I can't speak about it authentically because we didn't live that experience. We started, you know, I, I went to university at 35 and began the journey there. and. You know, we were already well into a successful career. So uh, I, I can offer some advice, and I think uh, Brent, Brent may be able to add some insight into that, is that the biggest thing for me in making all the changes and taking the risks and trying different things is self-confidence. And you've got to believe that you can handle whatever life throws in, in your way and that you've already got the tools and the skills. And if you don't know how, then you've got people around you who will help you. And 
uh, you know, I, I think that that's the biggest blessing that I've, I've had is to believe in myself and, and try. I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in finding people that you're comfortable with in their roles of whatever it may be, mentors or accountants or bankers or lawyers or friends that are having similar experiences and just talking it out a lot of times. Uh, you know, whether you go to a counseling session or you just yeah. sit down with some friends and have a beer and say, man, this just doesn't work or has anybody got any ideas that, well, that I think having almost like your own little mastermind group sometimes yeah. can yeah. go a long ways too. Just when you throw stuff on the table and sometimes great answers come from some of the most unlikely places. And, that, and uh, you don't always have to cut the path, right? Others have gone in, in similar ways and so, uh, you know, watch and study how other people have done it or talk to them and uh, ask, ask those questions. Out of our family, uh, our youngest son, we've got four kids and our youngest son uh, is the only one that started his own business. They all, the other three work for somebody else. But uh, he's, a, he's a perfect example of a young guy who, uh, a wife and two kids, and I often laugh, we, we look at him and we say, aren't you the kid we couldn't get off your ass to even mow the lawn? <laughs> And, uh, you know, he's got his own successful, uh, he, he, yeah. he's got a mechanical business out in Red Deer, Alberta, and he's done amazingly well. In fact, he sent me a picture from Hawaii today. He's taken a month off, and he feels that, and he, he's created just a wonderful specialized niche for himself that even though the oil field's got a downturn, he's still in demand for some of the great work he can do. And, and I wish I could say I could look at him and tell you exactly what he did. I wish there was some magic formula. But again, it was just a commitment. Him and his wife both just said, we don't want to work for somebody, we want to build this ourselves. So I think having a lot of determination, and that's easy for me to say up here. Uh, again, we haven't lived it being 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. I love right now thinking, geez, wouldn't it be great to go back 40 years and be in that mindset? But I understand the fear and the idea that you, you probably look at the world and think, oh, every, everything's, already, everything's already done. Yeah. Everything's already been taken care of, what's left? But I wouldn't have missed the radio years for anything, you know, so that helped. But, you know, uh, speaking of that, and Brent just, uh, going off something he brought up a little bit earlier, talking to people and, and getting advice. Uh, Gord Rawlinson, who owns Rolko Radio, um, I remember years ago asking him uh, for some advice, and he said to me, get as much advice from everybody and anybody. And he said, think of it as uh, gold, you know, a panning for gold. And he says, pour the advice in, let it go through, and sift. And there may be some nuggets in there that are relevant and that apply and grab them. I mean, you don't have to listen to everybody's advice and take it, but consider it. And, uh, you know, I think that's how we learn. So that would be some of my best advice for somebody just starting is, you know, you're not going to have all the answers. And uh, I was just at some training and getting refocused myself in, in Las Vegas in February. And that was the theme was, you don't have to know the hows. You need to know what it is you want. You need to be clear on what you want and the hows and how you're going to do it. You'll get there, right? But be clear about what it is you want and everything will follow. Or what you might also want to do is find some guy my age who's got a really successful business and his kids don't want anything to do with it and let him know that you would be happy to become his succession plan. <laughs> Not for a while, mister. <laughs> Which, but actually, we heard that yeah. at, a, at an NSBA lessons we learned, and it was... Um, Clay Dallas? No, not oh. Clay. This is a few years ago. Um, Curtis's father. Uh, oh, uh, Kurt Kearney Kurchinski. Kearney yeah. Kurchinski. And he was talking about, he eventually sold uh, his uh, company to an Australian Peterbilt. group, right. Peterbilt. But uh, he had said at that time, a, a young person stood up and said, boy, you know, it, how does one get in at, at this point? And he recommended that. He said, find some companies that maybe the ownership of it is getting on to the point where they're thinking about retirement or succession, they don't, and try to get yourself a role in that company as one possible way. Mm -hmm. Sounds like an easy way to the top. <laughs> <laughs> Has that, was that helpful? Yeah. Anybody else? Hi. Well, um, my first degree was in sociology at U of S. Loved it. If I could have made a living doing that, that just lit my heart on fire. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons I wanted to change was I really like money, and I wanted to make a lot of it. <laughs> and um, uh, so I, you know, I just I needed then my second degree was okay. Uh, as much as you love the studying, let's let's have it as a means to an end. So how do I get from here to where I need to be? Uh, I was fortunate that the U of R 
uh, came to town at that time and set up campus here in Saskatoon. So I did my second degree through U of R while still on the radio. And, um, but they didn't offer a master's program in the clinical counseling. They had you know, all kinds of other things, but what I needed wasn't here. And so uh, Calgary's program, uh, <laughs> are you a student now? Yeah. yeah. You know how when you read the research papers and uh, you see the names of the authors and everything, uh, when I first walked down the hall at the U of C in the social work department, all of these names on the wall, oh my God, I've read his work. It was like, <laughs> it was like rock stars, but academic, you know, like, and it, it, holy cow. And it, it was an incredible program. They let me design it according to my needs, you know, and what my interests were. So I had a lot of freedom and flexibility. They let me do a two-year program in one year. I did full-time class load and a full-time practicum at the same time. So I was exhausted when I came home, but it saved me a year. So, um, for, you know, for that reason, that's why I chose to, uh, to go out of province. I mean, it, if, it was it was here, if it was here in Saskatoon, I would have been there in a heartbeat. And plus it was meant to be. I recall when you first applied to the UFC, we thought it would be the following year, yeah. and all of a sudden they say you're in. Yeah. And we had to move pretty quickly on that too. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, you said you had to go through some really big names uh, when the, the boom hit. Yeah. And a question I like to ask entrepreneurs is, what's one key thing that you, the key element there is for an entrepreneur that helps them con uh, continuously evolve and reinvent themselves to stay relevant? You know, that's good. I know yeah. for Penny and, and both of us living it and some of our friends were witness to it too, we were terrified. Like we really thought the dream we had for this company and everything we were working towards was going to crash. And so uh, I, I'd even talked to our friend Paul. I said, so how does bankruptcy work for a company? And, you know, well, you, you have to consider all these options. And, and, you know, seriously, it's better to look it in the eye and say, okay, if this is where this goes, if it crashes and burns, well, we'll clean up the mess and we'll go again. But I know what happened in our case was Penny went from initially being terrified and worried to then she just got mad yep. and said, well, we're not going to let this happen. And she developed a plan to present new ways of, of, of uh, helping people in the business. And the model just, she changed it overnight, basically. And, and it's been a tremendous success for you us. You know, I, I think, I mean, certainly talking to other people and finding out, you know, how they faced it. But personally, have uh, being uh, able to redefine myself a number of times through my life, not just my business. You know, I was radio goddess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, sweetie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. then student, then business owner. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm constantly asking myself, who do, who do you want to be when you grow up? And so uh, uh, I, think, I think being an entrepreneur, that's part of it, is you, you want to keep growing and keep changing, and so you do it yourself, but you also apply those same skills to your business. And, it, you know, again, when your feet are to the fire, it comes a lot quicker. Yeah, yeah, isn't that the truth? Right? Yeah, it yeah, does. yeah, your motivation. turns on yep. fire. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Fear is a good motivator. Fear is a good motivator, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Give us some hard ones. I do wonder if thought, what I find uh, our students deal with is this hierarchy of opportunity. <laughs> Uh, being a small business owner is not seen as sort of exciting as being a BHP Billiton mm -hmm. sales uh, or, or director, not even director, but a, an employee of BHP Billiton. And I, and I just over at Ivy and Link this afternoon, a very similar conversation, right? Small businesses, not necessarily sexy, but successful and trying to make it uh, small businesses. We have this problem in Saskatchewan, I find, where the small business person is not respected, they're not seen as a key, and, and, and only those that are serving the oil and gas industry, the mining industry, are the, you know, seen as prestigious small business opportunities. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure, I, and again, trying to convince students that starting a business and, and, and being successful is, is far better than being a sales rep for BHP Building. Yeah. I, th I think it's a mindset, and I think, that, I think that's two very different uh, perspectives that, um, you know, I mean, being a uh, top executive in a big company uh, there's certainly prestige and there's opportunities, but there's also um, security and, uh, you know, but limits versus being your own boss. While it's risky, 
Uh, I mean, you've got control, you make the rules, and it, it can be as exciting as you want it to be, and it can be sexy, you know, and, uh, but, but it's, um, I know for me, I hate, and <laughs> Pam will tell you this, I hate living by other people's rules, and uh, that has always been me. Uh, that's just part of who I am, and so for me to be in a position to, uh, be in control of my life and make it exactly as I wanted to make my own rules, i.e. an entrepreneur. That is sexy. That is, that's the golden egg. Uh, you know, and that's very different than climbing the corporate ladder and, and success. And so uh, I think both are valuable, but for sure not everybody's going to want that I'm in control, I'll take all the risks, I'll do whatever it takes, and even if it, you know, if I fall on my face. Um, I, w I wish we had a better answer. I, yeah. it, and again, because we haven't lived it. Yeah. Uh, uh, part of me, I, 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 I would love that idea of being 19, 20, 22 years old and thinking, okay, I'm going to try this. Yeah. Easy to say now, but uh, I, I envy anybody who's at that stage right now. And, and like, what do you see in your class? Are the majority of your students wanting to go down that path? No. Yay. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yay. Good. Yeah. Good, good, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? There you go, Gord. We got our quota. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> yeah. but, you well, know. I only asked for one, but there was two speakers, so I think <laughs> we should have okay. two, you and we got two. Yeah. Double bang for yeah. your buck. You yeah. still get your check then, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we are, are living proof that you can, you can do one and then the other, right? And so maybe, maybe that's where the comfort level is, is cut your teeth in a corporation and make it to the top and learn your skills, and then venture out uh, versus, you know, heading in the deep end first. I, I don't know, but. But isn't that the challenge of success? That, uh, as opposed to some of the American marketplaces where um, failure is actually a, a, an important loss for yeah. else, yeah. it's been success and mm -hmm. it's like before all of that bad. Yeah. Like isn't that, is that part of that challenging mindset we have here? I, I think you're right. I, I think, you know, and a little bit it is we're still a small community here. Everybody knows everybody. and. You know, I think that was part of our motivation in our fear when we thought we were looking at the abyss, is we thought, oh my God, you think the embarrassment and... Well, you have your face on bus boards for 20 years, everybody <laughs> knows you, you but know. It's, but mean, you're right. It's, it's pretty it's public, <laughs> it's holy cow. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think uh, Saskatchewan is a little bit different scenario than, than maybe certainly a, you know, a, a multi-million dollar yeah. urban center or a multi-million person urban center. You could go and try your best and fall off the radar and nobody's the wiser and you move 10 blocks over and start all over. I, it, it is, I, I can see where it's a, it's a bigger challenge here. So again, it's, it's probably just internal fortitude that would keep you going, or move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, if I can just add a little icing on the cake, 22 years ago, four deans ago, we tried to get entrepreneurism as a major in the College of Commerce. And universities, as you know, move so <laughs> slow. <laughs> and, but when we started, you never heard the word entrepreneur. Y honestly, you wouldn't read it in the paper, you wouldn't see it in the news, you never heard of it. Now, I, as a right-wing guy, say that's the NDP that did that, but anyways, that's another discussion. <laughs> but it's your outside <laughs> voice you're using <laughs> here, Gordon. <laughs> yeah. My wife said you'd never make it in radio because you just shoot your mouth <laughs> <laughs> So, But now, all of a sudden, due to the work of the deans, it is a, a, a minor, and it's, I, mean, I know it's going to be a major, and you hear about entrepreneurism, and you read it in the ra uh, uh, read it in the papers, and honestly, that's only happened in the last five years that it's really strong. So it's exciting. Yeah. And um, just one other comment to the entrepreneurial guys: and you don't have to invent the next program. Mm -hmm. All you have to do, you can take any business and just do it better. Yeah than anybody else, and, it, and I mean any. And you know what? When times are good, businesses get real lazy. And I'll tell you, the, some of the service levels, because the business is just walking through the doors. Maureen and I have had 16 businesses in 40-some years, and I'll tell you, you had to earn every dollar. It didn't just come in the door. You, yeah. you went out and hustled it. And so now is a perfect time to start businesses because all you have to do is do what you say 
you're going to do because you'd be surprised. That will kill 90%. You know, how many times do you phone somebody and say, well, can you, can you do this? Oh, yeah. And then you have to keep phoning back. Well, yep. I thought you were going to, yeah. well, uh, you know, I got busy. You know, I got busy. And all you have to do is just do your job. Then if you really want to get all the business, just give them something extra. Mm -hmm. But listen, we've got to let these folks go. But we do have, because you were good, <laughs> and only because you were good, we do have. <laughs> do we get the, the wagon? I from the prize bin. Oh, <laughs> no. you, you don't get the wagon. <laughs> 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 But this is a, a, a <laughs> couple of books from uh, my wonderful wife who writes books. And we also have, a, excuse me, an original painting. Oh, oh, gosh. Yeah. Yes. We have, uh, that's, I can't that's you, Gordon. Well, yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, he's, he's removing Anyways, the bubble wrap. <laughs> it is. Gently. It is. Uh, original paintings from one of the books. Beautiful. Oh, so, oh thank you. And this is, the stories are about my misspent youth and all the trouble it got into. I've read some of them. Oh, I think I we know. had similar boyhoods. Yeah, and the stuff you never told your mom. And the one. love story. <laughs> That's what I love. And this is um, called The Fist Fight. It was my first and only. Oh, fighting words. Fighting words, yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. It was more a beating. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> for the other guy. Yeah, yeah. It's where I couldn't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Well, thank you, Gore. Thank that you, That is amazing. Well, that will hang Gore. in our thank home. Thank you. Oh, that's Denise. Yes, with of pride. course. Oh, yeah. with Denise, we've got some of her thank other you, stuff. Yes. You bet. So. Could beautiful. I also just say, uh, you know, a special thank you to the students that are here. That yeah. It's great seeing some business people and some associates of ours. Thank but you, uh, Boy, uh, you're at a great time in your life. And uh, I just had another thought when I see a hugely successful guy like Russ Marcoux sitting back here, who I understand is going to be taking some classes at the university. I bet Russ, right is, the, Russ is the kind of a guy uh, that you could probably corner in the hallway or buy him a coffee. or And that, that would be something I'd recommend a young person, that don't be shy of business people. Don't be intimidated of successful people. Phone them up. Say, can I come for a visit? Can I buy you a coffee? Can I have lunch? And you'd be surprised how many people are open to that, and we'll give you some great advice. Or try Brent's method and stalk them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know he's going to want a kiss before you leave, Russ. Okay? <laughs> but thank you all, and, and good luck in your future. Yeah, absolutely. The world is your oyster. <laughs> oh, cool. Isn't that neat? Sorry, I'm, I'm just the closer, so I, I, I want to thank um, our team, uh, Jan Kalinowski and Ray and Shauna and Larry, who takes pictures and makes posters and sends out invitations. And I want to thank everyone for coming. And with regard to that thing about Russ taking classes, there apparently is something that people over 60, he doesn't qualify, but anybody here who's approaching 65 who wants free tuition yeah. on credit courses, we, we may have deals for you. But don't wait until you're 65, for heaven's sakes. You can afford it. <laughs> Do it sooner. <laughs> so thank you very much. And, and for those of you who are coming with me, stay. And those of you who want to put practice right away, and the other thing is, I, I have to ask one more thing. You don't have to be an entrepreneur right away. So the two of you who are going to be entrepreneurs right away, there's probably 10 more people that might be entrepreneurs in their 40s or 50s or wake up one day or see an opportunity. So what the Haddocks are doing here every single year is planting seeds. And what our speakers are doing every single year is telling different stories on how the seeds got planted. And so just tuck it away for when you need it. So thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. See you next year.